dealing with economic warfare has given me the opportunity to meet and work with some amazing patriots. I'm talking from three and four star generals and admirals to real life spies. And one of those is my friend, Sam Faddis. Sam is a former U.S. Army officer, a trial attorney, and a career undercover CIA operations officer. Senior editor for AND Magazine at Substack, national security commentator, and a fellow member of the Committee on the Present Danger China. Welcome, Sam, to the Economic War Room. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Appreciate it. I'd like to talk today, if we could, about something that doesn't get enough press. Uh, we Americans tend to think, you know, we live insularly and we th tend to believe that everything revolves around the United States and we ignore the fact that there are very real enemies of our nation out there. So where do you see the threats? You, you used to work with CIA and others. What do you see going on around the world and the big threats? Well, my God, uh, you know, it, it, the term existential gets overused, I think, right? It's become almost a buzzword. But I think it is appropriate at this point in time for us to look around the world and say we face a whole host of existential threats, right? We were obsessed with ISIS and the caliphate. Now we have an Afghan super state with Al Qaeda as stronger, stronger than it ever was. China challenging us directly could blockade Taiwan at, at, any, at any moment, a southern border that no longer exists. And therefore it's not just an influx of illegals, Anything and everything, any kind of threat could walk across that border, be driven across that border. Uh, we just experienced either intentionally or unintentionally a biological weapons attack from China, right? We failed miserably in our response, and we're currently doing nothing to prepare for the possibility of a follow-on, even worse attack. I mean, we are in grave danger. Well, you mentioned that we're currently doing nothing, and that frightens Americans because we have a massive uh, intelligence community apparatus, huge. We spend so much money, billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, presumably to protect America. And you've been a part of that community. Uh, tell us, what are they focusing on if they're not preparing for this? Well, you have two problems, right? I mean, one is you can collect all the intelligence in the world and hand it to policymakers, but if policymakers don't intend to do anything with it, it's, it's kind of a waste of time, right? Prior to 9-11, we didn't have the specifics on the attack, but we certainly knew that bin Laden had already attacked us multiple times, was coming for us. That was inconvenient for Bill Clinton, so we let the attack mature. But in many cases, we're simply not collecting, and it's impossible for us to collect. We gave up Afghanistan. We have no access to the area. You tell me you want to spy inside the Taliban in Kabul. How? How magically am I going to recruit a spy in Kabul on the ground in Afghanistan and communicate with him when I can't get there, right? I mean, so we are both not doing anything with the intelligence, in many cases not collecting it. Well, let's just use Afghanistan as an example that why would we do that? We, we had a base there. We had uh, troops there. Why would we just give up everything? What, what's the purpose behind that? Well, you know, Kevin, I think you end up on this point where, where we end up so often these days, which is you get you can pick your poison. You can either ascribe it to the most grotesque incompetence ever seen or you can entertain the possibility, chilling as it is, that we're looking at deliberate malfeasance. There was no reason for us to completely abandon Afghanistan. Giving up the idea of turning Afghanistan into Switzerland and Central Asia was long overdue. The idea of pulling all Americans out and going blind, not a reasonable thing, and the, and the national security implications completely foreseeable. We'll pay the price. I mean, people will die. I hate to say that, but people will die as a consequence. Well, that's really sad. But what you make a good point is either gross incompetence or I've written a book. It's titled According to Plan. And those are the kind of options that we've got. Just complete incompetence. I, I'll buy it in one instance. If, it, if it's just Afghanistan or if it's just China or just the border. But in every example we, we can't be that incompetent. There's got to be something beyond that. Well, as you well know, I agree absolutely with you. I, 
I do not uh, subscribe to the Joe and his advisors just happen to be the most incompetent team in American history and get every decision wrong. I think you are watching guys who frankly are playing for the other team. They, they are not looking for uh, to, they're not focused on American national security. They've got a completely different agenda. We, the, the, the Russians built a huge base at Bagram. We turned it into a giant air base in South Asia from which you can deploy aircraft and dominate that whole region of the world. We handed that whole thing to the Chinese. Chinese are on the ground there. And on every any given day, we pretend like that didn't happen, which doesn't, of course, change the reality. Just that one piece of the Afghan puzzle is dramatic. And we gave that to the Chinese. You know, when I look and see the laptop and all of the payments that went to the Biden family and then these documents that apparently were accessible by Hunter and anyone he was doing business with, it frightens me. What do you think when you see the laptop? Well, I, I, I mean, I still retain a c access to a copy of the hard drive. I've seen the laptop. Um, I think everything about this case screams espionage. I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, well, I do understand why we keep pretending otherwise for partisan political purposes, but good God, the amount of money, the information, now the classified documents, come on. I mean, anybody else on earth has this information turned up about them. They're in custody, they're in handcuffs, and we're talking about sending them to federal penitentiary. You know, I, if the United States survives, and I pray to God that it does, for my children and grandchildren and so forth, there will be an exhibit in the spy museum uh, with the Hunter Biden laptop. I truly believe that. And I believe that the intelligence community is willfully blind to this, that they've turned aside for political purposes and political reasons. Now, we're going to need to take a break, Sam. But when we come back, let's talk about the willful blindness, the intelligence community and the national security threats. We're talking with Sam Faddis, who's had decades of experience protecting America, thinking about what our enemies are doing, investigating, studying, diving in. And we just talked about the Hunter Biden laptop and the national security threat that it poses. So Sam, given all of that, what do you see coming? What, what kind of attacks can be hitting America? Look, here's, here's what I think is, this, is the, the central thing that people need to understand. And I wish to God, by the way, that I wasn't in a position to say this. And I hope that I am wrong. I think we are compromised at the very top level, not just Joe Biden, but his national security team. So national security commentators are always talking about carrier battle groups and hypersonic missiles and all this kind of stuff. 
That's all great. None of it means anything. If your national command authority, your commander in chief is compromised, right? That changes fundamentally everything. And when people know that, when your enemies know that, they're, they're not just emboldened. This is a window of opportunity. So I think you are going to see for sure, already see, people take advantage of this window of opportunity. So example, communist Chinese, Taiwan, unfinished business for them, breakaway province. They regard it as an internal matter. It doesn't matter to the rest of the world. Taiwan belongs to them. There's no way on earth I can conceive that Xi Jinping looks at this situation with the guy in the White House who is very likely owned by him and doesn't move on, on Taiwan. And people need to understand, as you well do, that's not just bad news for the Thai, for Taiwan. That, that's not just that, that before we get to World War III, which it could very well ignite, that is an economic, that's economic Armageddon, right? When that supply of chips stops flowing, when all trade starts moving, stops moving in that part of the world, the whole world is economy crashes out of that. And and that 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 blockade could go into effect while you and I are talking. I mean, on any given day, they have ships and aircraft already in position. The only thing missing is them saying we're formally blockading Taiwan. That's where we are. And then you got to ask yourself if you're watching this. How much confidence do you have that Joe Biden is directing the Seventh Fleet to go break that blockade? Right? Because I'm not taking that bet. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you think of the Japanese, why did they enter World War II? Part of it was we blocked, they, we shut off their access to energy. You shut off our access to uh, high um, semiconductors, the best in the world from Taiwan, and, and you see the end of the world economy. You see it forces us into a war posture. But you made the point if our, if our command structure is compromised to that degree, controlled actually is the term that you use, you know, what can we possibly do about that? Well, I'm glad you used that term control because this is the, this is the term, this is what uh, yet another thing about espionage that the average person doesn't understand. There's no reason they should understand. They have normal lives. They don't w wander around this arcane world. Spies don't really blackmail people typically. And they don't sort of hope that they'll give you something and then you'll kind of lean in their direction. That's what diplomats do, right? We give you something and hope you support us. Spies crawl into people's heads, figure out what buttons to push, and then push those buttons and they transform you into a controlled asset. That is the term used in the trade. And if you don't control your asset, he's not considered recruited. So. They're not asking you pretty please, could you think about doing something for us? They own you. Now, how that happens is different for every person, but that is that is a real thing, sounds bizarre, happens all the time, and heads of state and key politicians all over the world get recruited all of the time and turned into controlled assets. So that's what I'm talking about with Biden. I've used that term repeatedly, I'll keep using it. Very real danger. Joe Biden is controlled by Beijing. Well, we have no idea who's visiting him at the private residence. There's no record keeping of the logs, the Secret Services. We, you know, they vet people that come in. But if you were going to meet with another head of state or whatever, you don't tell the president no. Yeah, well, I mean, the man goes off. The man has obviously Camp David as a presidential retreat that you and I pay for, right? He doesn't go there for a very clear reason because it's still official government property and therefore the Secret Service would keep logs and they would know who came in and out and you would know who came in and out. So he goes there to his Delaware home for one reason, which is for people to come in and out unseen. Now, maybe part of that is to pump him full of the drugs that yeah. keep him upright. But God knows what the other purpose is. And look, uh, on, you know, on the classified information thing that has come out. Let's understand, these are not minor documents. This is top secret stuff. It's critical. It's potentially fatal to American national security. And this stuff never leaves controlled spaces, right? You don't put it in your jacket pocket and then get home and find out you forgot about it. If it's leaving controlled spaces, you are right there deliberately violating federal law and committing a felony. And and I think earlier today I heard, I heard they found yet more documents. Now the special counsel is finding more documents 
There seems to be no end to this. Yeah, no, and this is from the guy who came out and was complaining about the former president, President Trump, taking documents out. We don't still don't know what those documents are. We know he declassified a lot. We know he had declassification power and, and authority as president, but the vice president doesn't have that, does he? Yeah, that's right. The president can declassify anything he wants is the ultimate classification authority. So saying that he took something out of controlled spaces and is in violation of the law is kind of, that's a fundamental problem with that, right? Also, they accused him of nonsensical stuff. You've got nuclear launch codes lying around. That's an interesting Hollywood construct that they use in plots all the time. But those nuclear launch codes don't actually exist in reality in the form that Hollywood says they do. So, in other words, apparently, magically, something that doesn't exist in reality was found in Donald Trump's house. I mean, it's absurd, right? It's made up. Well, even then, it's not parked next to his Corvette in the garage that sometimes opened and sometimes closed. It was locked up in a, in a secure facility that's controlled and protected by the Secret Service. Yeah, you know, the Corvette is an interesting touch, right? Because here's a man, Joe Biden, who at the age of 29 went in the Senate, has been a public servant basically his entire life. You maintain two households, even on a senator's salary, you don't have a lot of change rattling around at the end of the day. How is it that Joe Biden has all this money to buy antique classic Corvettes and all of this stuff? Where where did that come from? Because you could add up all of his salary he ever got from the U.S. taxpayers and it wouldn't amount to that amount of money. Who Who is paying Joe exactly? Well, we saw that in the laptop, didn't we? It's at $45 million plus has been shown. Uh, through Hunter Biden, and that's just what we've seen. Then we have the Ukrainian money and everything else. I mean, it's very, very, very dirty, and our our media is unwilling to discuss it because uh, they're, he's their guy, right? Yeah, unfortunately. A national security doesn't matter, apparently. Yeah. Well, we're going to need to take another break. When we come back, I want to talk with you, Sam, about solutions. What are the kind of things we should be doing now? Talking with Sam Faddis, one of the most brilliant national security experts that I know. He's worked in the field. He writes. It, it, just a terrific guy. But he's pointed out some serious problems that we have. A controlled asset in the White House, potentially. Uh, the Chinese may be uh, deciding to invade Taiwan, which would disrupt the global economy. I'm worried that they're going to try and take down the U.S. dollar and replace it with a digital yuan. And all they, maybe they released a biological weapon. Maybe there are other weapons that they're set to release. All of these are problems. What do we do, Sam? How do we fix this? Well, 
Kevin, I, I think honestly, uh, let's just focus on China first for a second, right? We obviously need an investigation of Joe Biden and a real investigation, not a pro forma, let's sweep everything under the rug and move on kind of thing. But I think we got to roll back the tape to when we climbed in bed with the communist Chinese, if we're just talking about that threat, right? We sold this thing on this idea that this was all cool because they were going to liberalize and democratize and we were going to turn them into friendly power. I don't know to what extent the people that sold us that bill of goods were ever believed it or to what extent it was propaganda designed to get the American people to support it. But I think you you have to admit, anybody has to admit at this point, that it didn't work out like that, man. You know, we made the dragon bigger, stronger, more vicious, more capable of controlling and crushing its own people. We fed the monster. And, and so we got to start by saying this is path we are on is self-destructive. We we are destroying the Republic and enabling our enemy. And we got to go back and revisit that decision, I think, first and foremost. We got to say, you got to climb out of bed economically with the, with the Chinese Communist Party. You know, when you go and, back to that, China was, when the book Unrestricted Warfare was published, China's economy was one-tenth the size of the American economy. It was roughly on par with Italy, right? And nobody sees the Italian economy as a globalist threat. What, how they got there was most favored nation status. It was uh, a, lot of tr a lot of really bad trade deals that we did. You know, Donald Trump was right about so much. We uh, uh, favored them in so many ways. And then it's the globalist movement that allows them to be exempt from you know, the, the clean air and, and the carbon dioxide emissions and so forth. Yeah, and, and of course, what has happened along the road as this has all happened, is that not only are we giving the Chinese the means they they need to build a nuclear weapons arsenal to threaten us and a navy and all of these other things, but we're giving them the money to buy influence in the United States. Um, you know, the House just uh, voted to establish a committee and I think succeeded in establishing a committee to investigate Chinese actions. And something like, I think the number 64 Democratic House of Representatives Democratic congressmen and women stood up and voted against it, branding it as anti-Asian sentiment and racism, right? Here you're trying. So you're like, okay, well, first of all, that line is straight out of Beijing's playbook. That's straight. Xi Jinping, I guess, wrote those talking points. But also it, it, it's like, you, okay, there's at least 64 Congress people who are owned by the Chinese yep. Communist Party and dare. I mean, they have self-identified. I guess that's the good news. So forget about like Eric Swalwell and Fang Fang or Ling Ling or whatever her name is. This is not about one guy. This is about them on an industrial scale buying the American elite. And that's the real danger is like, you see, we need to turn the ship. But man, we got people on board that are working for the other side and don't want to turn the ship. You know, they're they already sold out. They've already accepted that the Chinese win this. I know that's frightening to me, but I recall in 1996, Charlie Tree and a Little Rock uh, Chinese restaurant owner was funneling money into the Democrats and the Clinton campaign in 1996. It's all acknowledged they were interfering in our election. No question about it. It's in the Washington Post, LA Times, New York Times. Everybody acknowledged they did that, but they swept it under the rug. And yet with President Trump, they bring out all of these false allegations of Russian interference in the 2016. So here, here we're talking, you know, just 20 years later and, and they're making something out of nothing then and they're ignoring something that was very real. That was the beginning in my mind of when they started to buy the Democrats. Yeah, I mean, look, ultimately, this is another word that I think gets overused these days, treason, but this is actually an appropriate thing. And, you know, I'm kind of a history nerd, right? 1453, Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire falls, the end of Christendom, that's the Ottoman Turks at the gates, in an expressly religious war, Islam against Christianity. Who's the guy who built the cannons that knocked down the walls of Constantinople? He was a Christian Hungarian cannon maker. 
who went to work for the Sultan. Why? Because he saw the writing on the wall. He bet his money on those guys and he was getting paid. So he's blasting the holes that the Janissaries are going to use to go in and slaughter his fellow Christians. And he doesn't care, man, because he's counting the gold that they put in his hand. And that's that as horrible as it is, is where we are with so many of these people. They don't care. They they are bought and sold. And unfortunately, in both political parties, I'm afraid. Well, Sam, I got to tell you, that I, I hear all that. I and yet we have hope. And the hope is the economic war room and all the people following it, our intention is to train 10,000 financial advisors to weaponize a trillion dollars of capital to educate as many people on this threat that we're seeing because America, I'm not going quietly into that good night. You know, the, the, the uh, Dylan Thomas poem, do not go gently into that good night. I'm not going gently, I know you're not going gently and I really appreciate the excellent work and the writings that you're doing at Substack and Ann Magazine and so forth. It's just tremendous. You're waking people up and I'm grateful for you. Yeah, look, I refuse to acknowledge the possibility of defeat, man. I always say, I don't know how long the fight is. I just know when it's over, it's over when we win. Yeah. So we will win. Uh, I, I won't contemplate otherwise. Well, you've given us some great things to think about and to focus on. We need to be a part of the economic war that's fighting. China is largely waging it against us. The way that we fight back is to stop investing in them, and our friend Roger Robinson has, has, has taught us that. And, and if we really come together, because our system is better, and I love President Reagan's, uh, here's how you solve the Cold War. We win and they lose. And that's what I'm hearing from you today, Sam. Yes, sir. That's it. There is no other option, and we always win. My, I always say rule number one, the good guys always win. Rule number two, if we lose, the, we play again. We keep playing until we come out on top. That's all there is to it. We're not going to accept another option. Well, thank you, Sam, for being part of the Economic War Room today and for all the fabulous work that you've done in service to this great United States of America. God bless you, sir. Now, what Sam Faddis is talking about is very real. If we have a controlled asset in the White House, we're, we're gonna lose this economic war, which means that we've gotta empower and encourage the House of Representatives uh, to do the investigations, to root out the serious causes and problems that we're seeing there. Now, we're gonna summarize all of this in our free economic battle plan, and you can get a copy at economicwarroom.com. Remember, what we see as a marketplace, our enemies view as a battle space, and we saw that very real today with Sam Fattis. This is Kevin Freeman from the Economic War Room. Thank <laughs> you.